Astro 30 here yet again. As we can see, the REL T1 subwoofer is back on the desk. No, it doesn't have a problem. But I believe I'm using the wrong input to test the power output with. This input, the 0.1 LFE or low frequency effect, is supposed to be connected to a 5.1, 7.1 surround sound uh, receiver or something like that that has a subwoofer output. This requires a 44 decibel input. The input I should be using is the high low level, low level input. That's only 22 decibels. That could be the reason why we're not getting the full power because this one is twice the amount of gain required in order to get full output. How do I know this? Well, after I made the first video of this, I actually found the user manual for this and I was reading it and they suggest not to use this input at all, but to get the full effect of the subwoofer um, experience, if you want to call it that, um, is to use the high low level input or the speak on input from your uh, stereo speakers or main front speakers off the main amplifier or a combination of both. And I don't know why I'm mispronouncing that. It's bridge end, not brig end. Could be because the T3 that I was reading that off of was upside down. So I thought I'd correct that it's bridge end, not brig end. This also does not automatically turn off after a period of time. They've purposely designed it that way. So this stays turned on all the time but it has a very low power consumption of about four watts, which you know, at the end of the day is probably only about seven MA or something. So they say in the manual that's one 25th of uh, a light globe being turned on in its power consumption. What light globe they mean, I don't know, incandescent LED watt. But yeah, so it doesn't automatically turn off um, because they have like a, power starvation circuitry installed is what they call it. Anyway, what I'm doing today is I'm going to remeasure the output on this input because they say it's 300 watt RMS, it uses a 10 inch driver, but they don't actually specify what the impedance of the driver is. Is it going into 8 ohms, is it going into 6 or going into 4? Probably more likely a 6 ohm driver. Anyway, so if we can get around about the 150 watt RMS mark on this input, on the output, and get to clipping, then I know that that's within the ballpark of the specifications. All right, let's get started. Everything's set up again. Dummy load, oscilloscope. The internal oscillator is set to 100 hertz because I know that the roll off frequency of this is between 33 and 120 hertz according to the manual. Um, also, this crossover control doesn't appear to do anything to the um, LFE input. So I reckon it's bypassed and it's only effective on the high-low inputs. So I'll focus you in on the oscilloscope screen and I will turn the unit on. Give it some gain. There we go. I've just rotated the uh, pot for the, f the um, crossover. Hmm. We don't appear to be getting much in the way of output. It's, it seems like 72 volt peak to peak is the maximum we can get. Alright, which is only about 80 watts RMS. Hmm. Yeah, okay. Alright, I've reconfigured it now for 4 ohms. Doesn't appear very stable, does it? Alright, I'm going to say it's about 74 volts. 171 
into 4 ohms. That would be the reason each secondary winding of the high side is only 33 volts AC or 66 volts AC across um, 2 which gives us a total DC supply rail after rectification and smoothing of 93 odd volts and I measured across the collectors of the MPN and PMP output transistors and we're getting about 88 so we're only losing uh, about 4 or 5 volt there however if I measure this mystery winding we've got actually 114 volts AC there well when it makes a connection there we go 116 that's the actual high current side interesting which is 164 odd volt DC after rectification and smoothing yet we're only getting 88 volt across the collectors which is odd Hmm. Right, so let's look at the voltage across the collectors again. 88 volts. 89, 88, yeah. Which I find kind of strange. Alright, so what does this mean? Well, I'm not sure at this stage. I'm going to pull the amplifier back out of the cabinet. I want to trace where that mystery 116 volt winding actually goes to, just to see if I can make a little bit more sense of the circuit. So interestingly, what I have found out is the 116 volt winding comes into this first bridge rectifier down here, and this uh, 66 volt winding goes into this bridge rectifier. Now where this goes is I was completely wrong the other day when I said that the MOSFETs controlled the voltage here over for the 15 volt rail. No, it actually um, connects directly to it so the mm, positive of that rectifier goes to the positive going side shunt regulator and the negative of that rectifier goes to the negative uh, portion of the 15 volt rail where I've got my uh, new resistor. So this goes into there and that goes into there. Now the positive of that which I've lost there ends up at the source, the, sorry the drain of my new MOSFET and the negative ends up at the source of the other MOSFET and both these MOSFETs test fine but the positive also goes through a well the negative anyway goes through here the center diode and the positive also would go through the same point I would have thought no, that's on the other side of the MOSFET, the output side. So these two Zener diodes would actually be dropping the DC voltage that's coming off the rectifier, or this one at least is, directly affected by the rectifier. The, this one is actually on the after the rectifier. See, it's, there's no continuity, because it goes to that pin. So, but the diode goes to here, and that's on its anode. Um, and this diode goes to the source of this one on its anode which goes to the uh, negative of the rectifier. So the voltage readings I'm getting here at the collectors may be right but why have a 116 volt winding if it's only going to use like 88 volts of it? That makes no sense at all. Mm. Okay, so well, at least I found out what those mystery windings do. Uh, as I said, the 33033 goes into these uh, shunt regulators respectively, and the 116 volt goes into the MOSFETs. Um, but unless these filter caps are bad, um, 
I don't really know. There's 3,300 3, microfarad at 50 volt, which would be on the um, shunt regulator size. The, the, these ones are 6,800 microfarad at 100 volts, so they'd be on the high side supply line. Um, it is possible we've got a leaking one holding the voltage down, but I've tested some other electrolytics. This 4.700 volt over here doesn't test for whatever reason. Sometimes capacitors do, sometimes they don't. But the input capacitor tests at around 9 microfarad. This 10 microfarad over here tests around about 9 microfarad. This 47 microfarad 100 volt tests around 43 microfarad. So they're within specification for you know the tolerance. So I don't think we've got a faulty capacitor. Um, it's just that the plot thickens here of what they're actually doing. Uh, and why the 116 volt winding is only seeing like 88 volts across each of these collectors. Or 44 volt plus minus. I mean that could be intended design. Um, I'm not sure what the collector to emitter voltage of these transistors are, but um, I mean a plus minus supply rail of around 45 volts would be probably right and it would be around about the 80 watt mark. So whether that 300 watt um, figure in the user manual is actually a valid measurement or it's just a, a marketing wank ploy to get you to buy it. However, it does pack a punch at what voltages I'm getting. So I'm going to assume for all intents and purposes that this is perfectly fine and is working as designed. It just seems strange to me that you'd have a 116 volt winding and at the end of the day that's 180 odd volts DC. And then you're only allowing 44 plus minus out of these MOSFETs. Who knows, I don't even know what these um, xenodiodes are like uh, what voltage they are and interestingly these resistors don't connect in series with them they actually connect in parallel so you've got a resistor across both points of each center so these 1k resistors are in parallel with each of these diodes respectively um, which is another interesting thing but they may be using these as bleed resistors as well to uh, bleed off the voltage on these caps. There is another resistor buried down here on its own power resistor which may also be a bleed resistor across the two rails. So the plus rail and the minus rail. I don't know, I can't really get to it, but if I... No. It doesn't go anywhere near it. So... Yeah, I'm not sure. I can't really measure these without taking the board out to see where everything connects, but these capacitors would be across this rectifier and these capacitors are across this rectifier. And I'm assuming the black lead that comes in here, which is ground, is common to both supplies. So it's like a multi-tap transformer. See, there's our ground. Um, yeah, it's very confusing. But, I know it works. I did a bit more investigation. There's a diode here, which is just above this resistor you can't quite see. There's a diode down here. Now, the end of this diode goes to one end of this resistor here, which the other end goes to the output. Um, that goes through the cathode of this diode, which snakes its way around through a resistor back to the uh, base, which is there, so that is connected to the base of this trend. Uh, sorry, emitter, that's better. Base is here. Um, I think there's a PMP, and the collector of this goes through another resistor, which is this one here, which drives the gate of the negative side. MOSFET and conversely we've got this diode here which is connected directly to uh, the output via this resistor 
So the cathode of that end snakes its way around through here and does end up on the base of this transistor which the collector is directly controlling the gate of this MOSFET. So we've got the output signal coming through two diodes in different polarities um, controlling the bases of these two transistors. So these two transistors are the gate drivers. So in effect what they're doing is they're using all this circuitry using the diodes and stuff to control the base from the output as a form of bootstrapping to give the amplifier better linearity and somewhat better gain. So yeah, these are not actually error amplifiers as I first thought, they're just gate drivers, but their base is being controlled by the output signal, which is kind of neat. I just thought I'd share that. And conversely to that, if I am wrong, this could also be a VI limiter. So in the event that the output is short circuited, it's actually bringing the gates of these uh, MOSFETs to cut off so that it's reducing the current going through the output stage. So it's either one or the other. So if anyone actually owns one of these and is game enough to pull the driver out and measure the DC voltage across this collector and a collector over here on the other side and confirm to me in the comments that it's around 88 volts then yeah there's nothing wrong with this it must be right it just seems strange to me again that uh, we've got like plus minus 90 volts um, across each of these capacitors at our disposal and we're only using 44 of it half of it which is <laughs> kind of odd. Mm, anyway, it is what it is. So I'm going to assume that this is actually working correctly and the output power I'm getting is correct. It must be marketing wank. Anyway, um, I'm going to leave this video here. If you enjoyed it, please remember to rate, comment and subscribe below. And this is Yashra Thay saying as usual, see ya. Have a great day.